Hi, this is the overview video for chapter 3, Motion Along a Straight Line. So in these overview videos, I usually point out what I've covered in the recorded lectures and uh, how some of them might be different from what's covered in the textbook. Now, for this chapter, I'll have to come out clean in that there are certain important things that your textbook covers that I skip over in the lectures. Um, so, uh, especially for this chapter, I would say pay close attention to the textbook, especially for definitions and formulas. In the lectures, you are going to hear me talk about some of the conceptually important things and give some concrete examples of problem solving. But um, there are some gaps in the recorded lectures. So, so uh, let me point it out in this video so that there will be no more gaps. So uh, section 3.1, uh, which covers the definition of uh, position and average velocity is one such topic that um, that the lectures skip over. I don't ever define position uh, because to a point, I guess the idea of what a position is, that's uh, intuitive. What will be important in this class is expressing position as a function of time or as a function of something else. So, but to read a section so that you have a sense of what's important as we define position. And there's the displacement. You will see me use a displacement almost synonymously with the position. But there is a slight difference whenever we talk about displacement. We are talking about something that has moved, where the position has changed. Now, um, oftentimes you can set the position at the beginning, x at time equals 0 to be 0, then position and displacement are the same. Um, but I would say having the definitions correct is uh, still important. So um, to read through carefully. And finally, the average velocity is an uh, important one. In fact, this uh, um, the, the definition of average velocity, you will see that used in clever ways in a few times. So, I mean, it, it's an intuitive, um, I think when you look at it, uh, easy definition, average velocity is the displacement divided by the time, delta x divided by delta t. And, you know, it, it is easy. It's, uh, I hope, conceptually not difficult. What I think might be surprising is the number of places where this formula comes in in a derivation of some often used formulas. So uh, just file this away in your mind and be ready to remember it whenever we bring it back up. And um, one more thing, you are going to see two different expressions for average velocity. This is the definition of average velocity. This is always correct, doesn't matter what the context is. The second expression that you will see later is um, it's a formula for average velocity that will apply only under constant acceleration situations. But this is the definition. This particular expression is never not true. The second one you will see, I'll point out what conditions are needed. So that's section 3.1, definitions. And section 3.2 is where we start to talk about calculus. <laughs> this is calculus based physics class. And when we talk about, um, we're going to talk about instantaneous quantities, where the quantity itself is based on some sort of a difference over time. So how can that be instantaneous? It can be instantaneous through the magic of calculus. You just take the interval to go to zero. And this is the kind of the setup that has caused the Greek philosophers difficulties you know, like Zeno's paradox, although that's not quite related to this. Um, with the calculus, uh, what we assume is that all this introduction of limits and how this derivative is an exact quantity, um, we are relying on that to have been covered in your calculus one and that you understood it at a conceptual level. We make something instantaneous by um, by turning what used to be a difference into um, infinitesimal in a derivative. So, yeah, that's an instantaneous velocity. Um, other than that, now we are finally doing calculus. <laughs> Nothing new. <laughs> um, and the, recall the meanings of the derivative. So when graphically represented, 
derivative would uh, show up as a slope um, over a curve at that particular point. So if this is plotting position as a function of time, then the velocity, instantaneous velocity, would be represented by a tangent line, the slope of the tangent line. Whereas the average velocity would have been a line connecting two points on a curve, or the slope of that line. Okay, so that's one thing that this section covers. It also covers the speed, which um, other than making sure everyone's aware of the term, the definition of speed, we're not going to use it so much. So um, as the textbook says, in everyday language, most people use the terms speed and velocity interchangeably in everyday language. Now, um, in this class, because uh, we have sometimes of a need to have two different words to refer to two different things. We talked about vectors and scalars in chapter two. And as we talk about how quickly something is moving, sometimes we care about the direction, so we are looking at the vector quantity. Sometimes we don't care about the direction, so we are looking at the scalar quantity, the magnitude of how fast something is moving. And uh, we are going to use these two words in those two different ways. So whenever we say velocity, we'll be referring to the vector version of that quantity, so the direction will matter. Whenever we talk about speed, um, the direction won't matter. We are talking about just the magnitude. Now, average speed is the particularly mathematically confusing um, quantity. So one might think that, oh, speed is the magnitude of velocity. So average speed must be the magnitude of the average velocity. And as the textbook says, average speed is not necessarily the same as the magnitude of the average velocity. It comes down to when we define average speed this way, um, where it's a total distance per elapsed time, the total distance, uh, that's not quite the same as the total displacement, especially when something's like, imagine something moving in a circle. The total distance of something moving in a circle one time would be the circumference. But total displacement of doing that once is zero. So uh, long story short, I'm really going to stay away from uh, using the word average speed in this class. <laughs> we'll talk about speed. We'll use the word speed to um, basically refer to the magnitude of instantaneous velocity. And I'll uh, just never use the word average speed. Or if I do, I'll be careful about pointing out, yeah, it might not be the magnitude of average velocity because of these mathematical quirks. I, I don't think uh, this uh, distinction really adds to the, uh, your problem solving ability. So. so I'll just stay away from the term average speed. Okay, that's section 3.2. Uh, section 3.3. Now, when we talk about acceleration, uh, so I do have a, a lecture video that talks about the difference between velocity and acceleration from the conceptual side. Mathematically, what I would say is that um, you gain the most in mathematical treatment of acceleration if you think in terms of analogies. Acceleration is to velocity the way velocity is to position. <laughs> um, if the sentence made little sense, uh, look at the equation here. Uh, write this down side by side with your average velocity equation and see how they compare. If you swap this a for v, this v for x, that's exactly the average velocity. That's what I mean, you can work with analogies. Um, so anything that you could have said about the average velocity mathematically, if you kind of translate that over um, with the average acceleration, then it'll work. Now, physically, they feel quite different, um, and that's what the, re the recorded lecture is for. Uh, in terms of doing the math algebra with it, um, it just helps to think about the relationship from acceleration to velocity being very similar to relationship from velocity to position or displacement. So. Yeah, uh, like a velocity, acceleration is a vector. Now, with acceleration, if we were to take the magnitude of it, the scalar version of it, uh, we don't have a whole separate word for that. Now, one thing you do have to careful with the word acceleration 
is uh, when we define it this way, and especially point out, you know, it's a vector quantity, um, it's a vector in the same direction as the change in velocity. Now, if the change in velocity, this delta v, is in the same direction as acceleration, then great, you'll get a speed up. But if it's in the opposite direction to the velocity, then this is what the uh, textbook uh, 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 mentions. Keep in mind that the, although acceleration is in the direction of the change in velocity, it is not always in the direction of motion. When an object slows down, its acceleration is opposite to the direction of its motion. And although this is commonly referred to as deceleration, like in everyday English language, we say that train is accelerating in a direction opposite to its direction of motion. Or we might say the train is accelerating. So when we say that something is accelerating, we are really only saying that its velocity is changing. And in the next chapter, you will see even more interesting example where the direction of the change of velocity might not be either along or opposite the direction of motion, but perpendicular. Then you get um, where you have acceleration, but speed doesn't change. Uh, but that's for chapter four. Let's see, what else do we have in this section? I think that's uh, mostly an instantaneous acceleration. That's the same deal. You know, you go through the same process of making the time interval infinitesimally small. Then, you know, acceleration is derivative velocity. Again, the, that analogy uh, of a relationship of velocity to position helps. Um, so po velocity was a derivative position. So kind of swapping labels, <laughs> acceleration is a derivative velocity. This is the really the fundamental relationship between position, velocity, and acceleration, the three most important kinematical uh, quantities. And um, I don't think in the recorded lecture videos I point this out. I do have all the worksheet that's posted that start out with those definitions. Okay, I think that's it for this section. Uh, yeah, and you can see the analogy here. If I swap these labels, you know, velocity for position, acceleration for velocity, then like this could have been from the previous section. Um, so, okay, so the next section, oh, I think this is the section where your textbook does this twice. Um, so in your textbook, uh, they are going to be deriving the kinematics formulas, which you might have seen in your high school physics class. It, it's a, you know, a three, four, or five equations that you use whenever you are dealing with the kinematics problems. So in this section, your textbook will drive it um, using algebra. Even though this is calculus-based physics class, and this is the textbook for calculus-based physics, you'll see them do this derivation without not a single time using calculus, which is kind of amazing. Um, there are some clever tricks that you see them use to, in order to do that. And what I would say is that I think it's good to read it through to see what the, those clever arguments are like. Um, but the one thing about clever arguments is that they are sometimes hard to, to do them again. Like, you know, if you read through this section once and then try to redrive all this stuff on your own, it wouldn't surprise me if uh, you have difficulties doing that. I would have difficulties doing that. So, um, so the proper way to do this derivation that they do in section 3.4 would be to use calculus. And your textbook does do that. They do that in section 3.6. And um, you will see me do it again <laughs> using the uh, similar, well, using calculus approach, but making the limits of integration explicit. You will see me do that in the lecture video, so do watch that. Um, and uh, what I do say is that the, the kinematics formulas that they drive, they are useful. And, um, and it's worth uh, studying and even maybe memorizing them. Uh, and let me point out the places where you see them use the definition of average velocity in a really clever way. There are a few places here. Um, so in, I mean, this entire section is a uh, bag of clever tricks. So you see them use it here um, where you write down the, the expression for the average velocity and they're using this to really get the expression for the position. Um, and this the second expression is one that I was saying you have to be careful when you use it. Uh, so this is not a definition of average velocity. This is a formula 
special formula that's derived for when the acceleration is constant. So when the acceleration is constant, then this expression happens to give the correct value for the average velocity. And uh, your textbook does uh, explain this formula uh, with this graph, um, how when you have a straight line um, in the velocity as a function of time, meaning you have constant acceleration, then yeah, the average velocity would be this value. If the line connecting the initial and the final velocity is anything other than this, like this random looking thing, which is for an arbitrary acceleration, then the average velocity wouldn't be this point here. And you are going to see this formula used a couple more times for some clever derivations. Uh, one particular derivation that I want to point out too is maybe not the derivation, but more of the particular result that I think is significant is what we sometimes call V squared formula. And uh, as with the rest of this section, I'd say the going through the derivations. It's a good mathematical exercise. I think it will help you develop your mathematical maturity. Uh, it can be um, uh, not crystal clear how to go from one line to the next, but read this carefully and try to follow it on your own. And I think uh, for derivation of this formula without using calculus, um, <laughs> this is one where I remember seeing this formula uh, for constant acceleration being used uh, creatively, I think. Uh, so I guess what they are saying is, um, so using this expression for velocity, they derived this. And using uh, they derived this expression for position up above. And um, what they are saying is substituting this into average velocity, substituting this into time, and you do some algebraic manipulation to get this. That's what they're saying. Uh, try those algebraic manipulations on your own. Uh, I think it's a good practice for everyone. And um, this particular formula is really useful when you are trying to solve kinematics problems where you don't care about how long a particular process took, how long of a time. You only care about what distance and how much acceleration, what are the initial and final velocity. This is the exact formula that deals with all that without the time, because all the other kinematics formulas you will see will have some element of time in it. And later on in the semester, when we get to energy, uh, you will see other significance of this formula as well. And uh, speaking of other formulas, uh, I think you have yeah summary of these kinematics formulas. Um, the, this, you, these are this is the, like the table that you might have seen in your. Uh, high school physics class, you use this to solve kinematics problems. Great. I hope you had some practice doing that and you feel comfortable doing that. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, you'll have a lot of practice in the problem set. So please um, do let me know where you are stuck. Try out the problem sets early. So I think that's it for this section. The rest is application of those formulas to problems. I do have some lecture video where I um, um, demonstrate some of these and read through these examples. Um, more examples, the better. That's really the only way to learn this type of material. Uh, free fall, um, I do lecture on this a little bit, uh, mainly about our peculiar treatment of free fall. Take a look at that. And um, really, uh, when we say free fall in kinematics, it's nothing all that special. The only thing special is that free fall is the question where we already know the acceleration to start with. That's really the only thing that's special about free fall <laughs> when we're dealing with the kinematics. But you do have a lot of um, examples of motion, especially next to chapter, chapter four. Uh, projectile motion is an example of free fall and a lot of kinematics examples, um, it really practical scenarios come from projectile motion. So that's uh, the important thing about free fall. And um, the set of equations are the same ones you see above, just uh, with uh, this uh, substitution, a is equal to minus g. So uh, lots of examples. Again, I'm uh, skimming through in this video. I do recommend that you read through this carefully with a lot of time. That's the kind of exercise that uh, builds your um, uh, competence at uh, dealing with the situations like this, along with your problems and problems. 
Finally, section 3.6, as I said, um, it does the same thing that they already did in 3.4, except now using calculus. Uh, this is the way I would, uh, you know, properly handle this, uh, you know, in this calculus-based physics class. I can imagine the approach like section 3.4 in a high school physics class where you are really trying to do stuff that you shouldn't be able to do without calculus. And really the proper coverage of physics requires calculus. Uh, calculus was invented for physics. So, um, so uh, you can see here how this approach is so much more elegant, simpler. You don't need any clever tricks. It's a straightforward integration. <laughs> That's the advantage of, you know, sophistication, advantage of having spent a semester taking calculus one before you could take this class. So, and you will see me cover this in recorded lecture again with a slight difference in the um, kind of emphasis, but basically the same material. So that's all the sections in chapter three. And uh, we also cover chapter four this week um, to, so that we can do projectile motion alongside other kind of kinematics. So um, see you in those other lecture videos.